stellar lineup. Um, it's being filmed by Debbie from Deep, so it will be available on the city website, on the Deep website later for others who couldn't attend. Um, and we're here today to talk about the all-user restroom resolution that was passed by Commissioner Fish's office back in December. And the resolution gave a six-month window for bureaus to start converting the restrooms. So that's what we're going to be talking to you about today, sort of grounding in the principles, the, what the resolution means, and how we're going to sort of roll it out. Um, so everyone will have a chance to introduce themselves, but I just wanted to give you a quick uh, rundown of who they are. So we have Rose at the beginning, Casey, Caden, Nola, Emily, Jack, and Betsy. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nola to just get us grounded in some principles and terms before we get going. Awesome. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, I always get freaked out by my voice on the microphone. Is that okay? Okay, awesome. That makes sense. Is that okay? Awesome. Um, we just wanted to do just a tiny bit of um, terminology 101, because I know that we might use some words that uh, may sound unfamiliar or you're not totally sure what they mean, and I promise we're not going to go into like Gender Theory 2000, that's, uh, I'm going to try to keep it really simplified so the folks in the room are like, I don't think it's that simple. Bear with me, because I feel like sometimes just starting with like, I think the most basic is really helpful. Um, and so when we're talking about trans inclusive, we're talking about transgender people. So when you're born, I promise this is not going to be uh, any kind of science lesson. <laughs> When you're born and you come out this little freshly baked baby, um, somebody looks at you, right, and says, congratulations, you have a baby, boy or girl. And uh, they tell that, right, by what the outside of your body looks like. And so that's the <coughs> sex assignment. You're assigned sex at birth based on these characteristics. And with that comes a lot of things about gender, right? We get a name, um, we get clothes, um, we uh, start having expectations about who we are based on that identity. Um, and gender comes into that in a lot of ways, right? Is I think sometimes, um, maybe to explain it, is like when you get a name, and let's say that you're um, assigned female at birth, and you were treated as a girl, um, let's say that your name that you're given is Brittany. And when I say Brittany, who do you think of? Spears. It's cool, we can go there. Um, so you think of Rennie Spears. And so you're thinking of, I think you, you have some ideas in your mind. We have a shared idea, I think, among us of like what this person looks like, maybe what they act like, things like that. And so this baby girl um, is treated as a girl or woman throughout her life, and that's that's a gender. That's where gender comes in. And congratulations, we all have a gender. Uh, that's some common ground we have. We do have some folks in this world who don't identify with having gender, and I promise that's for another day. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, but understanding is that um, is that baby girl Brittany may hit like age five, because gender identity forms between the ages of two and five, sometimes as young as 18 months. Um, and so baby girl Brittany starts showing some signs, some patterns, and different things maybe. And this is a maybe, because this is not everyone's story. Um, Brittany, doesn't identify um, as being a girl and does not experience like this girl and says uh, ident identifying more as a boy. And so um, we might call Brittany um, transgender. So trans means to cross over. Um, and the opposite of that, cisgender, so if some of us use the word cis or cisgender, cis means to stay on the same side as. So Brittany, at age five, 15, throughout her life, continued identifying as a girl or woman, we might call her cisgender. And so, again, for the purposes of today, sort of the opposite of that is transgender. Um, and trans people have a lot of different stories. There's not like one day you wake up and you're like, hello, I'm transgender. Somebody walks, comes to your door and hands you a packet of information. Like, Here's your checklist for life, good luck. Uh, we all have very different narratives 
And I think it's so important to note that, is that not all trans people are the same. <laughs> Um, and so when we're saying trans, we're also meaning a lot of different kinds of identities. Some people identify as transgender, some people use other words for themselves to talk about gender. But it's the idea that you're not identifying with the gender that was assigned or given to you by someone else, and that's expected of you. So we're clear about that. <laughs> Maybe to complicate things a little bit more, um, Emily, do you wanna add some things? So I work for SMERC, which stands for the Sexual and Gender Minority Youth Resource Center, which is a resource for LGBTQ identified uh, young people between the ages of 13 and 23 here in Portland. We're just up the street uh, at 12th and Columbia. Um, we have an education program called Bridge 13, and we do a lot of, we do the expanded version <laughs> of what Nola just ran through very quickly. Um, we do a lot of education around uh, gender and sexuality for organizations that are supporting young people, but also <coughs> supporting organizations that are just in the world because queer and trans people are everywhere, uh, not just uh, children in our schools or in treatment centers or wherever, wherever they are. Um, I think just reiterating what Nola said about um, not all trans people having the same narrative is really important to keep in mind because that isn't necessarily something that we see um, reflected in the media a whole lot, in the in mainstream media. If you, if you dig deeper into lots of different types of media, you get lots of different types of stories, um, people's different personal truths, but I think a lot of mainstream media definitely um, perpetuates some myths that all trans folks um, take hormones and have surgery. Um, and I think that myth in particular is one that is particularly, um, well, A, it's not true, and B, um, it causes more um, problems when we're talking about supporting um, trans people across a variety of spectrums in the public sphere. Um, we work a lot with young people, obviously, and so um, when we're talking about gender and thinking about gender existing on the spectrum and fluidity, we talk with, we work with young people a lot who are using a lot of those different words that Noah talked about. So you can hear, you hear words like people having a non-binary identity or identifying as gender non-conforming or as gender expansive. Um, gender fluid is one that we hear a lot in our space. So, um, yeah. Everyone hear me okay? I definitely need the mic. So, um, my name is Rhodes Perry, and uh, I am a consultant. Uh, I do diversity and inclusion work um, all around the country. And one of the things that I do is um, I help government agencies implement LGBT specific policies. So, I'm here today just to talk a little bit about the national landscape, and then just to give you an idea, because I'm sure some folks in the room have questions around how do we convert uh, single user gender specific restrooms into gender neutral restrooms. So I just want to give you uh, one example of what was done in Washington, D.C. So um, I think that if anyone reads newspapers or looks at blogs or online, it's hard not to hear about um, transgender people and gender nonconforming people where we ought to use restrooms. Um, so we know right now, um, all across the country, there's 22 states right now considering anti-transgender, gender non-conforming legislation. Um, there's over 100 bills uh, right now. Um, and many of them are looking specifically at the issue of restrooms. Um, and I mention that just because um, this context is really important. This is kind of the bad of what's happening. Um, some of the ugly of what's happening is that some of these bills are actually getting implemented into law. So um, how many folks have heard of North Carolina's health bill too? Okay, so many folks, okay, here. Um, this is a good group. Um, so basically, one of many things that that bill does is it basically prohibits trans and gender nonconforming people from using the um, restrooms that align with their gender identity. Um, so effectively, um, as Nola was saying, their this bill is basically forcing trans folks to use um, the restroom um, based off of their sex assigned at birth or what was on their birth certificates. So um, this is really um, has major <coughs> health outcome, uh, negative <coughs> health outcomes and well-being outcomes for trans folks. I'm sure. Some of the folks on the panel are going to touch on that. Um, and um, it, it, 
so it's bad. But what I wanted to say is that here um, in Multnomah County and in, in the city of Portland, um, it's one of, of the few cities that are actually leading on introducing legislation that's really protecting and affirming transgender and gender non-conforming people. So um, obviously your colleagues, but also visitors that are coming to public buildings. Um, and um, which, which is really great. New York City um, recently did something similar. Uh, the Chicago Public Schools have issued um, really comprehensive guidelines <coughs> for transgender and gender non-conforming students. And I think just yesterday, I'm sure if some of the folks in this room helped um, the Oregon uh, Public Schools issue similar guidelines, which is awesome. So, um, so there is, despite kind of the, the negative media attention across the country, um, some really positive examples. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to briefly touch on is that in Washington, D.C., a decade ago, so this is, this is not kind of new stuff that's happening, it's just it's great that it's happening more. Um, the D.C. Office of, of Human Rights, along with a local advocacy group called the D.C. Transgender um, DCTC, DC Transgender Coalition, sorry, um, uh, work together to introduce a Safe Bathrooms DC campaign. Has anyone heard of this campaign? Um, if you're a Twitter user, if you like social media, you can actually type in the hashtag um, Safe Bathrooms DC, and you can kind of get, get a gist of what the campaign is. Um, but effectively, in DC, any single occupancy restroom must be a gender neutral restroom. So this applies both for government agencies, but also for um, small and large businesses. Um, so if you think of Starbucks um, or like co coffee shops that are local here, basically any kind of door, like restroom with a door that you can walk and one person is using must be a gender neutral restroom. And so this campaign was really great because one, uh, the district wanted to make sure that people, anyone, has the right to use the restroom that aligns with who they are. Um, but two, to really expand and make, make sure that there's more facilities to really honor people um, especially gender non-conforming people, um, single parents with kids of different genders, uh, people with disabilities, that they have access to the, to the right restroom that's going to um, align with who they are. So um, part of the campaign was to actually encourage people throughout the district to, to serve as allies, um, to basically, if they go to a business that probably didn't know that the law had changed, just to kind of, one, give a gentle reminder to the business owners to, to let them know that the laws changed, but also two, just to kind of take a quick picture and um, put that hashtag down, and the report basically goes directly to the to the Office of Human Rights, um, and then the Office of Human Rights just reaches out to to those businesses to let them know. Um, within the first few weeks of the campaign, um, over a hundred business or over a hundred bathrooms were converted, <coughs> and it was a simple outreach to the local Starbucks in the area letting them know, hey, the law's changed, and the district manager is like, okay, this is easy for us. Basically, they took off the labels on each of the single occupancy restrooms that said men and women, and put two signs up that said restroom, right? So for them, they, it, it was good business sense for them because the lines are shorter, it's good for every one of us because we can get our coffee faster. So um, you know, this is just a, a simple example that it's not um, as scary or hard um, when you are um, a government leader just like have, thinking about implementation. Um, some really basic steps, and um, I don't want to monopolize any more time, but if folks have questions about that campaign, I'm happy to talk about it after. So, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Felice, and I'm a policy advisor for Multnomah County. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited that the city has adopted this policy. Um, adopting LGBT inclusive policies is always important and significant, but especially in times like these, as Rose was talking about nationally, we are facing terrible discrimination. Um, we are seeing national legislation that is rolling back the clock on decades of work towards fairness and equality. And I just want to commend the city for continuing to move the dial forward um, and creating this policy that sends a message that reflects our local values um, here in Portland. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did at Multnomah County. In 2013, we adopted Executive Rule 0361 which established all gender restrooms to further the highest and best use of county facilities and foster an environment of inclusion for all county employees and visitors. And I want to talk a little bit about what prompted this action in 2013. Um, Multnomah County has always led the way in Oregon for LGBT inclusivity. We were the first jurisdiction to pass non-discrimination laws in employment, housing, and public accommodation that went beyond state and federal law. Um, 
We, our employee health care plans are trans-inclusive. We were the first jurisdiction to offer domestic partner benefits to employees. Um, we have trans-inclusive policies in our public safety facilities, and the list goes on. We pride ourselves on being a state leader in all of these issues. And then one day, we heard that we had employees that were leaving their work buildings on their breaks to use the restroom. So I'm just going to say that again. We had employees who were holding it until they could leave their building and go to the restroom somewhere that it was safe because where they work, they didn't feel safe to do so. This was really shocking to us. Um, something as simple as going to the restroom that most of us take for granted every day was causing great distress and physical harm to some of our employees. So to help us respond, we reached out to the county's Office of Diversity and Equity, um, to SMERC, and to Basic Rights Oregon. We also did research on best practices, but honestly at the time there wasn't a lot of information out there in terms of how we would go about a project like this. Um, we're a very big employer, we've got over 5,000 employees, and we serve clients for a county of over 750,000 people. So it was a big project to take on, and we really relied heavily on our community partners to figure out what we should do. Um, so I'm going to read you the text of the executive rule. This is, this is where we landed with our partners. The county will make reasonable efforts to include all gender restrooms in number and location appropriate to the building's use in any new building constructed by the county or renovation of an existing county facility. And then in addition, to that executive rule for new facilities and renovations. We identified where we already had all gender restrooms and made sure they were visible and listed in building directories. And we identified gaps in access to all gender restrooms in existing county properties. The easy part was complying with the new construction and renovation. Uh, for example, um, we're building a new downtown courthouse. So um, obviously we're gonna have single stall all gender restrooms in that new design. But then we're also taking it a step further and we're in design phase um, to figure out how we can have multi-stall all-gender restroom. They do it in Europe and we're figuring out where in the courthouse that, that would make sense. Um, the bigger challenge was with our existing facilities. We actually found out that we didn't have a central database of where restrooms were in all of our buildings. <laughs> and that was surprising to us. Um, so we had interns um, over the summer go and just figure out in our buildings where we had restrooms and they recorded structural information as well as population and usage information. And where we identified single stall restrooms, we then had our sign shop just switch the sign, just like Rhodes was saying. Um, we also created wayfinding signs so that we could reduce the extra step of clients having to ask where an all gender restroom was located. Um, once the changes started happening, we did receive very positive feedback from employees. Uh, it, it was great. We had employees and public um, email in just saying how much they appreciated it, um, both employees that were personally wanting to use the restrooms, and then just the compassionate coworkers um, and folks that were serving the general population. And then we had the um, unintended positive feedback of the lines are shorter. <laughs> if you just have two restrooms for some, right? <laughs> um, uh, so the, the, we did have some challenges in the project, obviously. Um, even now, there will probably be some challenges uh, that you face. And you know, back in 2013, I feel like there, we didn't have a lot of examples of this happening. Um, and so the, the first challenge that I want to talk about in, in just the project that's involved are some county services uh, are operated out of buildings that we don't own. And so we had to, once we did our own facilities, we had to do outreach to landlords to find out if they would be willing to um, let us make some changes in, in the buildings that we were leasing. And in some cases we were able to do that, and in some cases we weren't, particularly where there were multi-stall restrooms. But in, in one of the cases where we weren't able to create all access, employees came up with a really great solution, in my opinion. They created signs near the restrooms welcoming gender diversity, inviting staff and guests to use the restroom that best fits their gender identity. So essentially just publicly stating that this is a safe space for you to use whatever restroom you choose. Um, and then the signs that they put up also provided instruction on how to access an all gender restroom on another floor. 
So one day I think restrooms will be all gender inclusive, but until then we're working with what we have to make our facilities as welcoming as possible in Multnomah County. And in the end, I believe that we did accomplish what we set out to do with many lessons learned along the way. Um, for me, the most notable lesson was this. We moved very quickly when we learned employees were leaving our facilities to use the restroom. I think all of us can agree that just using the restroom is a basic right, and as an employer, we have a responsibility to provide a safe space for people to do that. Um, so naturally, we wanted to act fast, but in our effort to move quickly, we didn't fully recognize the education and training and discussion that should have happened prior to implementation. Um, it wasn't that our employees were against it, there were just a lot of questions. Um, Multnomah County made national news when we did this, it became very public, and while the reaction was overwhelmingly positive, we could have done a better job arming our employees with information so that when they encountered members of the public who did not support the new policy or just needed more information, they would have been better prepared. And I think this forum is a great example of a lesson learned and something we could have done better. This would have been great for our employees. Um, and just to wrap up, I want to say there are lessons learned with every new initiative, and we're always happy to share what we learn so that others may have a smoother path to learn from each other, and if we can assist in any way on the project, we're here to help. And Dan, I just really want to thank you um, and the city for adopting this policy and creating a welcoming environment for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Kaden. Uh, I'm a trans FTM uh, individual and I work with Smirk uh, sometimes. Um, and I just go there as well because um, it's a safe place. Um, and I have been out as trans since I was 16. Um, and ever since then, uh, bathrooms have been a pretty intense, kind of nightmarish thing for me, uh, which always seemed weird to me. It's just the bathroom. It's not like I go in there to do anything else besides pee and poop, but um, <laughs> people seem to think so. Uh, so <laughs> when I was in high school and going into bathrooms, it was challenging because people would always take what they know gender and push it onto me. Um, and so ironically, I had a, a more difficult time going into the women's restroom than I have had in the men's restroom. And I think that stems from maybe fear of men um, uh, doing things, but uh, they would uh, sometimes get upset, sometimes they wouldn't. It was always a hit and miss kind of situation. Um, I've been out in public uh, going to Powell's or like some other you know, business. Um, I've had incidences where some women have actually uh, uh, attacked me. Uh, and that seems shocking, but for some people it's like, almost like a, a life or death kind of thing where they get so scared um, that this individual who looks kind of different and or, you know, a man uh, is coming into the women's restroom like, oh God, you know. Um, and so I've been, I've been slapped, uh, I've been pushed down. So it's always very a hit and miss kind of situation when I've been in public. I always constantly have to be aware of people looking at me and their reactions and I'm always gauging whether it's a safe bet to go into the men's or the women's, or, you know, should I take long, should I go number two, or should I just go real quick and run out? Um, it's, so it's never just like, oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom and then leave and everything's fine. Um, it's always been very difficult um, with this social anxieties, especially just like, um, Men and women tend to stare, I've made fun of. Um, it's, it's never just an easy thing to go to the bathroom, it's just so strange. Um, and so I think that uh, in my experience, I, like you were saying, some people were holding their uh, ability to go to the bathroom and then leaving the business and trying to find, and that's actually what I do as well. I, I kind of gauge in the city where are the safe bathrooms to go to, and then where I've never had problems, and then, or where the gender neutral bathrooms are, and I, I tend to go to those places if I'm not safe in my little area of home. And uh, it's 
not the best thing because I have type 1 diabetes and maybe some other people in here have blood problems, but I constantly have to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so it's always just like this social anxiety where if I leave and I go into this new place, am I going to be able to go to the bathroom? Am I going to have problems? Like I've been told to leave a building before. Like um, it's just not like security's told me to leave a building. Like it's not just a, an easy thing to just go and do. So I constantly, even just going to the movie theaters, it's just like, can I go to the bathroom afterwards? Like, everybody's got to go to the bathroom after the movie theaters. Um, there's a lot of people who go, but you know. Um, and so implementing gender neutral bathrooms, it would just be a huge, just like, relief uh, for a lot of people in the ability to just go to the bathroom. Um, and it's an important thing, but I also think that it's, blown out of proportion as well, because it's just going to the bathroom. Like, it's actually the opposite for us. We're, we're terrified of going to the bathroom. So some people are terrified of us going into the bathroom, but in reality, they're, they're more terrified of the stereotypical, like maybe uh, incident happening. Um, there's some media people who put scary stories out there that are completely untrue of actual facts of what happened. Um, we get attacked by people and hurt by people, um, and I have no intention of hurting anyone. Um, and so these bathrooms would just be incredible. Um, it would just be like, just hey, going to the bathroom like anybody else. Boom. Not even think about it. Instead, I have to think about it constantly, all the time, and it's just it's exhausting. So uh, I think that this huge change would definitely help out a lot of youth and a lot of people. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Katie again. Um, uh, I should have introduced myself before. Uh, my name is Nola Young. I work as a consultant to a variety of businesses and organizations and government agencies on the inclusion and celebration and building um, understanding and capacity for understanding of LGBTQ people. Um, in the past year or so, I've been doing especially a lot more work um, with these folks on having <coughs> trans people as employees, workplace um, inclusion with school districts. Um, I was really thrilled to finally see the release yesterday of this policy. I make it weepy. It's something we've been working on for years. Just to say, like, there are basic human needs that can be met, and they're okay. And they don't threaten anybody. They encourage, right? And so I think sometimes when we talk about policies like this, I think sometimes people get hung up on like, why do we need a special policy? That's a special thing. I mean, I truly believe like if we can think about what does it mean for trans folks to have the possibility to use the bathroom safely, we can figure out the safety and inclusion and support of a lot more people. Because I think sometimes it pushes us to our boundaries and understanding about who people are and difference in those things. And so I think one example is, um, is with having gender neutral bathroom, um, trans folks are, especially if you have the awesomeness of having any of us in your employ, we are resilient, we are creative, we've had to like deal with some stuff in this world to survive. And that makes us really smart. <laughs> um, you know, that's my one last plug of why you should hire trans people. But, <laughs> um, you would greatly benefit from having any of us. <laughs> Believe me, I'm serious. Um, and, and, and knowing that is that if we are your employee, it also means that we need to be supported in that space like other people are. Um, you know, in places I've worked, um, I'm a trans person, and if you're looking at me and you're like, I don't totally understand that, I Feel free to invite me to lunch. I on your tab. I am an awesome. Person. I would I would love to have a conversation with you about about that um, about why trans people look differently than each other and why there's not again that like one experience of being a trans person. Um, that's not really a joke. Totally feel free to go out to lunch with me. It's awesome. Um, but if you you know but if but if you're thinking about an inclusive policy in your workplace. Um, that means that you've solved something, too, for other people that maybe you weren't thinking about. 
The thing about this policy is also we talk about all user restrooms, and not just all gender restrooms. All user restrooms mean that that dad with a two-year-old daughter who feels real uncomfortable at the thought of his kid going by herself into the women's restroom without him. He doesn't want to go into the women's restroom with his kid. And so he's going to very probably uncomfortably take his daughter into the men's restroom with him. There's like discomfort all around for everybody. And I wish that we were at a place of where it was totally normalized for you to like just take your kid into any bathroom when your kid needs to go. And that's not totally the case. So an all-user restroom means that that dad can take his daughter, regardless of where he is. It also means that um, if you are experiencing disability and you have an attendant, you have someone who's your caretaker who might be a different gender than you are, same scenario plays out. What bathroom do I go in? Do I go in the one that I'm gonna get yelled at or the one I'm gonna get yelled at? <laughs> and so it means, so when I say like when we, the value of trans inclusive policies like this one, means that we create opportunity to support a whole lot of different configurations of people and families and all sorts of folks. A gender neutral bathroom means that there's a possibility for anyone. There's a lot of reasons why. Does anyone in this room love using the bathroom in a public multi school bathroom? <laughs> Let's just be real. <laughs> um, I don't know that any everybody is just like, I need to do this quietly so nobody hears what I'm doing. Don't act like you don't do that. <laughs> so, we're all very conscious of other people in the bathroom with us. I, there's, I can keep going through the list, I promise. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different reasons why something like this helps is to say having a gender neutral restroom available in multiple buildings, so the city of Portland needs that. Your employees who are experiencing, like what Kanan talked about, that is, those are, those are youth, those are children, those are adults, those are elders, a variety across the age spectrum of us. Um, I don't go use a men's restroom because I do not feel physically safe. In the men's restroom. And depending on how I'm dressed, uh, how my hair is cut, if I'm looking a little bit more masculine to people, if I go in a women's restroom, same thing, I get either, I get some eyeball looking at me, you know, at the sink versus yelling at me to leave the bathroom. And I'm like, I don't, has anybody in this room ever like had to not use the bathroom? Like you have not used the bathroom for 8, 10, 12 hours, 16 hours at a time? It's an awesome experience, right? It, your body gets real messed up when you keep doing that. Um, and so when we think about this, when we think about it, it's like what is the possibility of offering a basic need um, to a variety of people? Um, and that I think that extends to when we talk about all kinds of trans inclusive policies. You know, and that's where well, there's a lot in the news right now. There's a lot, I mean, Rose talked about it and surfaced it, of like, we're looking at legislation. I'm from Mississippi, and, uh, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> I heard it, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> really, yeah, I do. I love, I love my home state, and I'm deeply angry that I feel like it may be impossible for me to go back and live in my home state if I wanted to. Um, even if it's just like, what would I do to go to the bathroom? <laughs> I can't go to my grandmother's house because she lives like 50 miles from anything. <laughs> so if I'm in town, you know, it's like, what do I do? Uh, I'm grateful for uh, the existence of a policy like this because it means when I come to do any business at the city of Portland, it means that I know that there's a bathroom that I can use. And that's a big deal to me. Hi. I really appreciated Casey bringing education back into the um, conversation so explicitly, uh, because that's what we do at Bridge 13, is do a lot of education, a more expanded version of um, how Nola broke, broke down some one-on-one -on -one stuff for us in the beginning. Um, and I just took a couple of notes of some things I wanted to, to mention in the spirit of education, even if this, this is just the quick and dirty version. Um, we work a lot with schools, and uh, the conversation about bathrooms comes up a lot with our school-based uh, clients as well, both PPS and private institutions, and I'm talking like preschools through colleges. Um, and 
one of the things that we talk a lot about is not only making sure that there are bathrooms for people to use, but also work with our clients to talk about how um, that piece that Casey was talking about is that um, people need to understand why <laughs> there need to be bathrooms um, for everybody to use. Um, and so we spend a lot of time with our, with our schools talking about, um, okay, it's great that you're you know, making it possible for your trans students to access a bathroom so that they don't have to hold it all day, but also what are you doing to make this school environment, the school climate, uh, a safer place for your queer and trans young people, right? Like, yes, everybody needs to go to the bathroom, it's a basic human right, um, but then also, you know, they're in this building for however long the school day is now, like seven other hours, right? They're not going to the bathroom the entire time that they're in school. Um, so we talk a lot about what are the other things that institutions um, can be doing to make uh, queer and trans folks feel welcomed and seen and included and heard. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about pronouns. Has anybody been in a meeting or gathering or something where people have shared their pronouns? Yeah, seeing some nods, some hands, awesome. Um, one thing that I tell most of our groups is that uh, there's no one way to get at people's pronouns. Um, there are lots of different ways to, as, as groups, um, you know, include it in your office culture, your organizational culture. Um, you can ask at the beginning of meetings. You can have people, you know, when somebody new gets onboarded, like there's lots of different ways and I think a lot of the hype that I see with our clients about pronouns is people are like, oh, but we don't, we don't know how to, like A, it feels awkward to ask, and B, we don't know how to do it. Um, and so again, since this isn't a pronoun workshop, we're not gonna get into it, but I will say that I don't think there is a, um, there's only one way to be engaging with pronouns. We have a saying at Smirk, which is that pronouns are public. There's a lot of folks that are like, oh, but it's like private, and it's like, no, pronouns are just like the word that people use when they're talking about you and they're not saying your name. Like that's, that's it. Um, so I think again with that creativity, uh, it's a fun opportunity to be creative about, okay, if we're trying to make people feel seen and safe and included, um, what are the ways we can do that? You're the experts in your own places of work, in your own communities. What are the ways to be getting that uh, information? Um, and in response specifically to they, as a gender inclusive uh, pronoun used as a single one, um, biggest piece of advice. We do a lot of skill building in our Bridge 13 workshops also, and I would say um, the biggest piece of advice I have about they is that if you've spent your entire adult life only using they as a, as a plural pronoun, you are not gonna like go home tonight or go to happy hour after work and be like, hey, it feels totally fine to use they as a um, single, singular pronoun. It takes practice. Um, reading children's books and uh, swapping out pronouns with they as opposed to he or she is actually a great way mm -hmm. to practice. Like literally practicing it on your tongue. It's not, it's not, there's no magic pill, it's not just gonna happen. Um, so it's my practical piece of advice about the, the they as a pronoun. There's lots of, Google they as a singular pronoun, Google, lots of, lots of resources out there. And the other thing I would say in terms of education and resources is also, do folks know about mix as a gender neutral honorific? MX, uh, another great thing to Google. Um, it is the newest addition to the Miss, Ms., Mr., Mrs. Pantheon. Um, and I think again, another thing to keep in mind is that um, you know queer and trans people are not new, like been in the world forever, right? Um, so that's not a new thing. And our language changes over time. And so language is fluid in some ways like gender, and I think that that's really important to, to remember and keep in mind. Um, this was before my time, but I, so I have heard that for a while, you know, there was a lot of contention around Ms. as an honorific, right? Like, it didn't exist for a long time, and then people advocated and said, I wanna be seen in this specific way, and our language needs to reflect that. And so we added Ms. to the, to the words, to the honorable words that we use to describe people with respect, right? And so mix is another way to be doing that inclusively. Um, so thinking about language as more flexible than we give it credit for is a lot of fun. And if you want to talk more about that, 
I could also go to lunch. <laughs> but, good lunch. Good lunch day right now. Um, but also, um, this is what verse 13 does, and I'm happy to talk to you more. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jack Costello. Uh, she, her, hers, please, would be awful keen. Um, I work with Parks and Recreation, yay parks, um, and I'd say about a month ago now, I, I went ahead and came out at work as trans, which is a step, um, and the responses have been great, all the way from incredibly enthusiastic to completely neutral positive. Um, <laughs> as, as a trans person, I can't tell you how overjoyed I am when nobody notices me. <laughs> it's the best. Uh, it's the rest. Um, to dive right into talking about bathrooms, um, I really liked what Nola said. Discomfort all around for everybody. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I use the men's room currently. And, and going to the restroom is uncomfortable because there's a foot of space and I don't have that many pairs of shoes, so like they're bound to know it's me, right? <laughs> like you can't not, you see the shoes. Um, the, urinals are, the urinals are right next to each other. There's never music. I still don't know why the one universal thing that would make us all feel better would be having like, death metal going. <laughs> complicated because it's uncomfortable for everybody, but it's uncomfortable and for me. Um, when I decide which restroom I'm going to use, it, it's its own event because I have to enter into an agreement with the restroom and with myself. I need to look at the choices, all right, men and women, and I need to decide, okay, well, I'm sporting, I don't know, this cute polka dot thing, so we'll call that like neutral. Um, but, oh, Adam's apple, oh, deep voice, oh, I'll just, I'll do men's, I'll do, I'll do men's. You know, it would be better that way because if I walked into women's, then what? Do I want to roll those dice? No, of course not. There's a policy. Great. Still not going to roll the dice. Um, so I'll go into the men's and I'll think to myself, okay, I am agreeing that I belong in a male space. That's what I've consented to. I have agreed that I don't belong in a female space, that that is not a space that's available to me despite uh, how I identify, despite this incredibly unique transition that I'm going through, which, again, if anyone is keen to it, I also enjoy lunch. <laughs> Katie likes lunch, too. A lot of people enjoy the second meal of the day. Uh, and this is where that single, that single restroom is good, because I can tell you what, if it showed up, I would pretty much exclusively use that. Um, there is no reason for me to have this gendered tango every time I just want to go to the bathroom. That's all I want to do. I don't want to be noticed, or notice myself particularly much. I don't know many people who go to the bathroom and just think about themselves going to the bathroom. Um, and that's great, and it's great that it's all user. It's great because a single room is important for people, not just trans folks, not just for non-binary folks, for lots of people, because there are so many reasons, reasons that I haven't even thought of for a person to use that single room. Fantastic stuff. Um, but I think it's important that we try to go a step further. As a city employee, as city employees, we're not just members of the community, we're leaders of the community. We represent people. This is the standard. As city employees, we are out there with people. How we communicate is how people perceive the city. Oh, this is who I work for. These are the parks I plan. These are the restrooms I use. This is how they speak. This is how this city speaks. This is where that education really comes into play. That training, that additional, let's make it an inclusive culture. And that's where maybe Maybe we need to think about not just having one room set aside for non-binary folks and trans folks and all the other users. I don't want to have my identity put into one room while these two other rooms get to keep on existing, untouched and unscathed. Great. We gave you a room. Will you please stop making us uncomfortable in these bathrooms? I don't want that. 
we could we could lead a charge. We could actually say, no, 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 this this is great, and we're definitely doing this, but it is not enough. Let's let's look at ourselves. Let's look at why we're really uncomfortable. Is it safety? Okay, let's work on safety. Great, out of the way. Uh, let's work on uh, cleanliness. Okay, we got cleanliness now. We taught everybody not to pee on the seat. A plus. <laughs> and let's get down to what's really making us uncomfortable. Let's try to talk about why we might be uncomfortable sharing space with somebody who has a different gender than we do. Let's invite that into our space. Let's try to do this all-user, multi-occupant thing. Because, heck, like, what have we got to lose? We're all decent people. We're all used to having difficult conversations with the public and with ourselves and with others. And if we're not, what a great opportunity. Let's do lunch and get uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's important that we try, because if it doesn't happen in this city, if it doesn't come from people who have this privilege, people who have this power, then who is it going to come from? At some point, you have to decide that the quieter voice is just as significant as the loud voice. And I am one of those quiet voices. So it'd be awful keen if we really went for it. Hi, I'm uh, Betsy Ames with the Office of Management and Finance. Um, and I'm here to talk about some of the things that we are doing. Um, uh, I think um, there were copies of HR 2.04 outside, which is um, the HR administrative rule um, that was recently updated. There's been predecessor rules for a while, but um, HR just um, HR uh, Director Anna Kim just recently updated that to um, uh, be more in keeping with modern days. Um, it, and that's the gender identity non-discrimination policy that the city has. Um, at the same time, um, back in December, as Ann mentioned, uh, the city council passed a resolution um, directing that we um, move forward with a number of different steps um, to consider all user restrooms um, for the city. Um, and that um, uh, Resolution directed us to do an inventory of all of our restrooms, both multi-occupant and single occupant in the city. Um, it didn't surprise me at all that we didn't have a um, unified <laughs> um, inventory of restrooms because we are a commission form of government with lots of diverse uh, buildings throughout the city. Um, what might surprise some of you, um, and we're still in the process of compiling all of that information for um, all city facilities, is that um, we have over 900 restrooms in the city. Um, over 500 of those are single occupant restrooms. Um, and um, around half of those single occupant restrooms are at parks and recreation facilities. So we, we do have a lot of them um, out there. And um, the other thing that the resolution directed us to do was to convert any of those single occupant restrooms that are currently gender specific, either identified as male or female, um, to all user restrooms. And we are using the term all user at the city because it is about um, more than just gender. It's about um, allowing someone with their personal attendant. It's, it's about allowing um, a father with a seven-year-old daughter who's kind of, you know, I'm not sure if I want to just send her off or um, whatever, to be able to um, use the single occupant restrooms um, and have that as a um, viable option. Um, the bureaus are, um, some of them have already converted those and have changed the signage. Um, others are in the process of doing that. Um, Parks is going to be um, re-signing all of their um, single occupant restrooms, including the family restrooms. Um, so it's it's going to be a process to get that all um, in place, but um, that is moving forward now, and um, all the property and facility managers from um, eight, nine, ten different bureaus are working on that. Um, there also was direction in the um, uh, resolution that um, we bring forward a policy about uh, new construction and substantial renovation. Um, and uh, we have had a uh, draft of that available online for people to comment on. Um, 
We got a lot of great feedback from folks um, and have an updated version of that online now for review. Um, I left some slips of paper on the um, table outside that had the, the link um, to that as well as to the HR policy. Um, so if you want to um, check it out and provide some additional feedback um, through next Friday, that would be great. We're planning on bringing um, the policy to council on either June 1st or June 8th for adoption. Um, so in that policy, um, they said look at new construction and substantial renovation. When they said substantial renovation, they were thinking of things like the Portland building reconstruction. Um, we uh, decided um, that it really should be um, we should be considering whether there are opportunities for all use <coughs> restrooms um, as part of any um, type of renovation over <coughs> five hundred thousand. We define substantial renovation as being over five million, um, but um, bureaus, if they're moving forward with something, need to be um, considering whether they can incorporate all user restrooms. Um, for new construction, um, we have said that at least 10% of the toilet fixtures need to be in all user restrooms um, with at least one per restroom bank, which is how we're defining kind of a combination of multi-user, single-user uh, restrooms. Because, you know, it's no good if you're making people who want to use a all-user restroom take an elevator down or you know walk you know half a block um, to get to it when everyone else has an option right there. Um, uh, for the Portland building, um, we don't have well. There is one single occupant restroom um, in this building that is potentially accessible. Um, it's behind a gate. It's in a workspace. Um, uh, so in our conversations with um, facilities folks and in preparation for the Portland building um, construction, we said, well, what can we do in the interim? Um, and so we are planning on having, um, uh, we're doing two things. Um, one, we're um, going to be putting in um, more uh, private uh, partitions in the first floor bathroom so that um, folks that um, are choosing either a male or female room down there but want a little more privacy will have more privacy. So, you know, not the, and anyone who has gone to the bathroom in this building might recognize that our partitions are a little bit um, shaky. If you put a bag over the hook, <laughs> often the door will start swinging open with you. And that's, that's not comfortable for anyone. Um, so having um, more um, privacy um, in those bathrooms with um, larger doors up six inches from the floor rather than a full foot, um, you know, still need to be able to see underneath to, you know, in case something unfortunate happens to someone. Um, but uh, having privacy on the first floor for those um, very publicly accessible restrooms. On this floor, we are going to convert these two restrooms, the male and the female restroom, to all-user, multi-occupant restrooms. Um, we want to have that option available to people. We want to get feedback from people about their experience using those restrooms. Um, they will also have the more secure um, privacy um, partitions. Um, and it's a floor that's accessible to any employee in this building without having to go through, um, you know, be buzzed through or sign in saying that you're going on to the floor. Um, and uh, we, as part of the Portland Building Reconstruction Project, we're going to be having comment boxes available for people to comment on anything that has to do with this building. And one of the things that we're going to be seeking input on is how's your experience using all user multi occupant restrooms on the second floor? Um, so that's a step that we're going to be taking. Um, we have to get the materials, we have to get the contractor on board, so it might be a couple months before you see that, but, um, or it will be a couple months before you see that. Um, but I wanted to share that that's something that we're doing and something. Um, that we want to get feedback on um, for when we do go into the Portland Building Reconstruction Project. Um, so, 
as part of the Portland Building Reconstruction Project, we have an opportunity to really rethink how we um, do our bathrooms here in this building. So we are going to be looking at all user multi-occupant, more single occupant restrooms, um, continued gender specific restrooms, et cetera. So there's an opportunity with this project uh, because we will be getting into the walls, we will be getting into um, replacing systems um, to really do something uh, with this building. Um, so that is happening. The last item from the resolution that I wanted to talk about is with the inventory in hand, um, OMF is also going to be working with bureaus about um, how we might be able to provide all user restrooms in all of our city facilities. Um, some like um, the City Hall, there are no single, well there's one single occupant restroom in City Hall as well, it's in the mayor's office behind <laughs> closed doors with security sitting out there. Um, but you know, what can we do in City Hall and how much is that going to cost? Um, and so council has asked us to come back after working with the bureaus on how do we um, provide all user restrooms in all of our uh, city facilities so that is another um, work effort that is going to be led by OMF that is going to be involving all of the different bureaus. So I think that's about it. And I like lunch too, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like you get a lot of lunch dates to me. Um, yeah, we're going to have questions, but can we give them a quick round of applause? It is one o'clock, but we are staying for questions. So please feel free and it's uh Yes, I like to know how many multi user restrooms currently in the city that you have converted to the single user. I don't think we have converted any multi user restrooms to single yes, user yeah. restrooms. In my workspace, you have taken a men's restroom and you've converted it to a uh, all user restroom. We have three restrooms at our facility. Two of them are single user, one's a multi user, and that has been uh, changed. And, and, and I'm just curious to know how many in your system you've done and how many more you're going to do. I don't know those numbers. Um, we can follow up directly on um, your. Uh, facility. I didn't realize it converted any multi-user to single user. It's designated as single user there, but they were using it as multi-user because there's a urinal and a Oh, toilet. okay. Yeah, we have a shower in there too, so it's, uh, it's <laughs> definitely a multi-user restroom because the vast majority of the employees are men and that has just been, and, you know, it's just been the men's restroom. But there are also two single-user restrooms, which one which was already an all-user. One was set aside as the women's restroom. And so now, presently, the signage says they're all-user restrooms. So if you weren't aware of our facility being changed, I take it you're not aware of other ones that possibly have been changed. And I'd like to know how many have been changed this time, so I can report back to my fellow members, because they're curious to know. And I said, okay, I'll come to the meeting and ask questions. And, and that, that's part of the commission form of government, you know, with different bureaus in charge of different things. Um, I'm sorry, so, are, you yeah. OMF? are you with OMF? Yeah. Okay, well, it was yeah. a, I'm, I understand I was an OMF employee or somebody sent by OMF to change the sign. That was the council direction on the single occupant. Okay. So. Okay. Yes. So it's a long time to wait before this building gets renovated. Um, when we move into lease spaces, are is there accommodations in those lease spaces to accommodate multiple generations? Um, that is a similar um, conversation that was mentioned um, at the county. Um, for lease spaces, um, the policy is saying that we are going to make it as a regular practice to ask for all user restrooms. Um, there might be situations where the landlord says, no, we're not going to convert our multi-occupant restrooms into all user restrooms, but that's definitely something that 
we're going to be looking for when we're going out looking for lease space is having um, all user restrooms as part of it because of this um, the council. being made in the city to like educate the general public of the employees about what's going on because it sounds like we've already got some you know preemptive strikes issues going on so how do you how do y'all plan to get everybody on the same page that is something you know sort of a, that Casey was talking about I think a rollout plan has been lacking um, particularly in this form of information sharing where it's really siloed per bureau so I know that there's stuff happening at Peabody and at Parks in terms of information sharing, but there hasn't, we haven't developed a citywide strategy for doing that, and I would agree that that's necessary. Um, I think it needs an owner, so who is gonna take on sort of a citywide approach to education and information sharing around this issue in particular? Um, we don't know or don't have that in the works right now. I think, I think Deep would be able to help. To get a lot more allies in the room to sort of help us in the interim, you know, as this is happening and as it's in the news a lot, you know, it is important that we do a lot more work around that. Well, I, I was saying that uh, I think Deep would probably be able to help because we're employees for employees. I think that would be um, a great forum to work with Betsy and the other folks. Can I make a, a comment? I'm, I'm an architect actually working on, on the parks, a parks project right now, but I think that AIA might be really interested in this kind of discussion also. Um, architects should know uh, that this is a really big, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's the Architecture Association of North America, basically. It's a, it's a Portland chapter, I think. Might be a good venue to talk about this, so, you know, it's definitely, I think, going to change my approach and how I, I talk to my clients. Mm -hmm. So. Any other questions? Yeah, um, first, I just want to say thanks to all of you for sharing your stories with me here. I think that's a really important message. And uh, my question is just about locker rooms. I know there's locker rooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I'm Kristen Weldon, project manager for the Portland Building Reconstruction Project. So, the new Portland building, I can almost guarantee we will have, we'll have a solution for locker rooms for all user in some capacity. I don't know what that will look like yet. Um, and I would love to have a user group that, to bounce ideas off of um, to make sure that we're designing things appropriately. We haven't gotten into design yet. Um, we're, we have the RFP on the street for the design build relocate uh, team right now. So um, I don't know yet what we will have when we come back in the building. And I, I don't think there's any current plans to do anything uh, temporary the way that we are with the first and second floor restrooms, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, um, first off, thank you for uh, presentation and for you sharing your stories and experience. Um, well, I work for Parks and Recreation and as, a, a, as an agency that serves a lot of the community, a lot of youth, one, one of the um, things that we've experienced is that um, we have children younger and younger who are identifying as transgender. And so um, I guess I'm curious as to, do you, can you point us to resources around the service aspect of that, because we've had situations where, um, you know, children as young as seven are, are identifying, and what we found is it's the parent, it's the parents' reaction um, to that, and so I think, you know, we obviously, um, with this change, um, need to really kind of help prepare and train our staff around how how to manage those conversations. So. I uh, appreciate the comments of you know, Bridge 13 and if there are other resources. Uh, I certainly would love to take you out so much. <laughs> uh, I 
can give you maybe an idea of a couple of like local resources. Um, one is my encouragement of you know, working in parks is especially is giving coaching to your employees who interface with parents and families. I think in my, in my work in doing um, what I call it cultural humility education is um, and working with folks, it's amazing how many adults say, like, kids don't understand this stuff. And I'm like, okay, hold the phone. You don't understand. Or you've had a lifetime of learning stuff. And that's what happens, I think, with parents and families sometimes. Is, like, they've had a lifetime, 30, 40, 50 years, 60, et cetera, of, like, understanding a fixed idea of gender. And then they have kids who kind of, like, throw them for a loop, right? And then it's like, you don't know. And it's like, that's actually really harmful to your kid is to say, I don't believe you, or you're doing the wrong thing, or you know all of those things. Um, so one is thinking about your employees who have that interfacing of like, let's talk about, there's a lot of resources up here, folks who can do some of that coaching, to handle the conversation in a really gentle and, and, and with empathy, mm -hmm. gentle empathy way. But also thinking about you can refer families to Transactive Gender Center, um, who partners with Brave Space, which is a, a therapeutic space specifically for children, youth, and families. And then Key Flag, parents, parents and friends, lesbians, gays, it's slightly outdated name, I think, at this point. Um, but it's a, there's a lot of awesome parents who are part of Key Flag who have trans kids. Yes. The very best thing that a parent of a trans kid can do is talk to another parent mm -hmm. of a trans kid. Um, those are two resources, at least locally, I would mm -hmm. highly recommend that your staff know. Especially when we're talking about younger children. Right. We start talking about kids with 13 and up. Spurk is a great peer space, but for that peer parental support, those are my recommendations. Anybody else? Can I add to that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Transactive also does have a parent group, too, that's specific for young children. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the younger crowd of, of kids. Um, and you said it as starting at seven. It's starting at two and three. No, I, I understand um, that. I'm just so saying our experience. Your experience, right. right. Our but, experience. And to be clear, the experience isn't necessarily with the parent of the transgender. It, right. It's, 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 sometimes. Uh, it's with the absolutely. parents whose children aren't in their reactions. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and, and then the other piece that I think is it's great to be educating the staff as a parent myself as, of a gender nonconforming child. The, the reaction of, of the staff, actually I've had really positive experiences at parks of having a child who was born male who likes to wear a girl swimsuit and not having any, we've, we've experienced zero negative reactions, which it terrified me the first time that my child decided to do that, to be honest. And it was just like, is it okay to bring my child in? And, and it's been a really good experience. And, and I just want to let folks know that you know, at one of our community centers, Matt Dishman Community Center, we have a we have a teen group called Queer to Queer. And, um, we started about a year and a half ago. That a member of P Flag approached us in terms of creating that space, um, and um, I think it's been a real wonderful opportunity for you know teens to come. But it's also I would say you know we're in a continuing a process of really being able to educate our employees and, and other users. Um, and you know we have a lot of dynamics. So I, I just think these kinds of conversations really are helpful because uh, to a large extent we try to sometimes reinvent the wheel and not everybody knows of the organization. So I think you know for, for us as we go forward, it's not just about changing signs on bathrooms. It really is about how we are you know also interacting with the public and with ourselves in terms of uh, you know acceptance. So not only acceptance, but just embracing mm -hmm. embracing the change. The only other thing I would add in this context of like like Parks and Rec staff being able to I love what you said about talking with empathy um, with parents and community members, um, but also especially with the younger age kids. Um, what I talk about a lot with you know elementary school teachers is about how you know kids are having a, kids kids know their gender identity really young real early um, and they're also sort of policing each other really young and really early so another role for people who are in caregiving roles is not just in interfacing with other families and other adult community members 
but also is in supporting young people themselves in their creative, imaginative playtime, uh, and making sure that everybody feels safe when they're doing that. And the Multnomah County Library also has some really great resource lists of books um, that are already put together. If you just go to their homepage and type in LGBTQ, um, you get lots of pre-made lists of like very wonderful children's books already to go for you to check out and share with your own kids. I just wanted to thank all the cisgender allies who are here because like, we are the minority. So without you guys, we're kind of screwed. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other last questions? Great. I want to thank you all so much for coming, and let's give them another round of applause.